Habits and Health, Episode 73. Welcome to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of Habits and Health, the podcast where we give you ideas on ways you can change your behavior to improve your health. And my guest today, Dr. Rachel Beanland. She's a public health doctor, a coach, a yoga and meditation teacher, which is quite an unusual combination. She supports women in medicine who are committed to personal development and looking to create mindful and sustainable change and using evidence-based tools. And she guides them to find balance when building their career to live a life that they're really wanting to live. So that's this week's episode with Rachel Beanland. Hope you enjoy this episode. And as usual, if you know anyone who would really enjoy some of the information that Rachel shares, please do share the episode with them. Habits and Health, my guest today, Rachel Beanland. How are you, Rachel? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to have you here. And you're in, I was going to say, an exotic part of the world. Do you consider it exotic? Wow. Um, I'm in the French Pyrenees, up in the mountains. It is very in nature, I would say, is the way to sum it up. So I can see out of my window now, I can see forests for quite some way and mountains. And yeah, for me, that's very grounding. This is the place that I find myself. Was that a deliberate intention to move there? Yeah, yeah. So... We moved to France eight years ago, mainly because we were spending more and more time here and we were really drawn to the mountains. So even in the UK, actually, which is where I'm from, I spent a lot of time in North Wales, going up to the lakes up in Scotland. And yeah, for me, the mountains really allow me to feel grounded and centered. So even in France, I've been drawn to spaces in the mountains. And then here, we're in the Ariège, which is like a very rural part of France. And our intention here is to be able to live very closely with the land. So what right. we have is a sort of small kind of eco farm, and we're trying oh. to produce most of our own veggies and fruit and living in a bit of a, what some people would say alternative. I feel like it's probably the way that, that the majority of people need to start thinking about living, being more respectful of the environment and thinking about what we're doing every day and being more conscious really. Well, I think there's some things we can explore there later in the episode. That sounds very good. A question for you. Who are you? Wow, that's a big question. Who am I? (laughs) Okay, so I suppose I would say that I am someone who is trying to live this life that I've been given in the best way that I can to be able to make potentially an impact in the world that I live in, but at the same time, be very aware of my space. And I think that's why I'm attracted to the mountains, because in a way, the mountains remind you of how small you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, as a person, I really try to think about what I am compared to the people around me, the beings around me nature everything so that's who I am at the core a very traditional answer of that would be what I do but I like to try and separate myself from what I do and what I am as a being I think well and it's fascinating to hear how people interpret the question and how different would you say you are now from say 10 years ago 20 years ago Wow. Okay. Very different, I think. Although I think some of the things that I find myself enjoying now, that real joy, I suppose we talk about flow a lot, don't we? That sort of thing where you find yourself into that flow. Mm. Those are probably the things I did really enjoy in my sort of early childhood, later childhood. But it's quite funny because 20 years ago, I graduated from university. So I'd qualified as a doctor and that was when I'd finished. Mm. I think my vision of the world was quite different. My vision of what I could do as an individual was probably very different because I'd been trained to think in a certain way. And at the same time, I think for maybe the first 10 years of my career, I really struggled to try and feel like I could be myself in my role. And I think a lot of us really struggle with that, don't we? It's something that does take time to really feel like you can be authentic and Mm. to find those environments where you feel like you can truly be 
yourself. So yeah, very interestingly, probably quite different, I think, from yeah, 20 years ago. But in a way, if you weren't quite different, then that wouldn't be good, I don't think. No. And I think that is the joy of life, isn't it? For me, life is about adventure and exploration. I've lived in different countries. I love meeting different people. I think that's the joy of online life, really, isn't it? In the world we're in now, you can connect to people all over the world. You and I are having this conversation through an online platform. And I think without that sense of exploration and being inquisitive as to what if what's that about I think life could feel quite I don't think dull's the right word but I just feel like that is part of life learning learning and trying and sometimes things don't work and you have to reassess and try again but yeah I think if I was if I hadn't changed over 20 years I'd probably be want to know why (laughs) When you first decided, I'm going to move to wherever, did you find it an easy decision or was that quite difficult? Yeah, I think I'm someone who makes decisions quite solidly. So sometimes it appears quite quick, I think, to other people. But they're always thoughts that have been in my mind. And the idea of living in a different environment for me whether that's a different country or even a different city. Mm. Yes, there's an element of unknown, isn't there? There's an element of like uncertainty. Mm. But I think in all of those moments, I've always tried to turn that on its head and just let the excitement of it take over Mm. the unknown. And yeah, I think I even now when I make decisions about moving in places, it's very much like that. And I think some of confidence with my decision making comes from a sense of being confident about how I can be in a place. So I've always thought of home really as more not where you are, but how you are. So for me, that involves my husband, the two of us being together and creating that sense of home. The actual space obviously is a choice, but Mm. it doesn't create that sense of home for me. And where were you before France? So I came from the UK before France, but very early on in my career, I spent some time in Honduras, so Mm. in Central America. And then I also, a little bit later on, spent some time in South Africa. So I was always excited by these opportunities and just saw them as ways to see what was going on in the world and understand diversity of people, diversity of illness, diversity of life, really. And I think, I don't know where that necessarily came from, but it was something that I always found very interesting, Mm. you know, trying to understand things, I suppose, from other people's perspectives. And I think that's really enriching, isn't it? Particularly in the world we live in now, where we're so divided, it can sometimes be very difficult to think about other people. And we often end up in our little tunnels of influence don't we but I think the more you can see different things the more it opens your eyes to be Mm. considerate and open to other human beings you you mentioned that you graduated as a doctor I know that now you do much more than just I wouldn't say simply a doctor because that's amazing as it is but tell us about all the other things that you do apart from being a doctor Yeah, so I suppose my own career as a doctor, I got super excited about global health and like the health of other populations. I really wanted to try and use my skills to uh, help people everywhere, really, not just in the UK. And so I trained in public health in the UK after I'd worked in hospitals for a period of time. And that's really given me that ability to look at prevention of illness, as well as the treatment side of things. And within that now, I work with global organizations. So I still do that. So I still come in my doctor role, if you like, for some of the time. But my own sort of journey of exploring what I wanted to be like and being more reflective led me to yoga and meditation. And that is where that side of my life started to become really important to me. So I would say probably over the last 15 years, but really heavily over the last 10 years, I started to build up a really regular yoga practice. And then that sort of expanded once I explored the philosophies and the kind of understanding around it. So I trained to be a yoga teacher and a meditation teacher. And now I combine both of my worlds to support other doctors who are trying to transition into different careers because I've been 
able to find my sort of own little path through a career which can feel quite fixed and rigid a lot I believe a lot of that has come from what I've learned from yoga and that approach to life so I now combine that with my coaching with other doctors to support them through a lot of their transitions to be able to get more control of their time and find that work-life balance that they might be looking for. Yeah, because doctors, it's crazy. From the get-go, from the initial studying, they're expected to work ridiculous hours. The whole thing about being a doctor is helping people be healthy. And the training that you're going through and those hours that they're having to work, it's not healthy in any way. So it's, it's setting people up with the expectation not to be healthy yourself, it seems to me. I think that can be a real challenge for people, actually, because if I look back at some of the jobs I did where I was doing really intense shifts, it's a real privilege to be in that position as a doctor. You're really caring for people and often you're supporting people through really traumatic periods of their lives. But you need the energy to give to other people. So if you don't have that internal energy yourself coming Mm. from a healthy place, eventually Mm. it can be very draining. And I did find that for myself. I found that it was... I would often give and I wouldn't be really be looking after my own health, be it my physical health or my mental health. And I think a lot of people can fall into that trap where they are. And I suppose that's also a lot of other caring professions. People give a lot and don't have the energy to really sit down and reflect on what, what is the priority. But I, I do believe that we all can improve our own health by doing very simple things. Mm. And by doing that, we have so much more to be able to share with people. And for doctors, that means that you can then be a role model for your patients, for your community, for society in general. Mm. So I do think there's a sort of two aspects to it. There's one there's that sort of as an individual being the healthiest you can. But then actually, the more we can do that as doctors, the better we can be for our patients, really. Talking about studying to be a doctor... If you were given the powers, some fairy godmother, whatever, gave you these powers, that you could change the way that people study to be a doctor in the UK, what changes would you make? That's a wonderful question. I think I would really try to readdress the balance between looking at illness and looking at health and maintaining health. Because when I studied, the amount of time we spent on thinking about prevention and thinking about maintaining well-being was so small Mm. it was like maybe a sort of eight week course with one fold sorry I went to university for one laptop so I just realized a lot of people listening thinking what are you talking about a folder like a (laughs) ring binder and I, I guess now we live in a world where there is so much available to us there's so much information out there that there is a lot of things that we do in our lives that can be detrimental to our health. Mm. And there's also so much information and evidence to show us what to do and what not to do. Mm. So we have all of this at our fingertips, but I think that we all need that support to be healthier, to be in that state of wellness. So I think that's what I would bring in if I could really And I think it is better these days. There's a lot more movement towards lifestyle medicine and thinking about your different aspects like sleep and stress and movement and how that affects you. But I think really getting doctors to think about prevention of illness and not just the treatment aspect of it. Obviously, we need drugs. We need research into good drugs and the treatment is essential and surgeries, et cetera. Mm. But without the other part of it, we are not going to be able to increase the overall health of the population in any country. So the way you work now, you mentioned that you're training other doctors. Have you got just general patients as well? What, how, how is it you work at the moment? So all my public health work is very much at a sort of research level, policy level. So I don't see patients one-to-one anymore. So all of that is done completely remotely. Occasionally I go to big meetings and things, but most of it's done remotely. And I work 
because I always had an interest in infectious diseases. So I work a lot at the moment, a lot with COVID, but my expertise really is in HIV and TB. So I work a lot with organizations that are looking at policies and guidelines for those illnesses. And then, yeah, when I work with doctors, I do a lot of one-to-one work because I realize that really helps people to move through some of their challenges and barriers that they're facing and break down some of those beliefs that might be holding them back from making a change that they really want to do. And the, uh, the delight of that is that I can do that online as well. That really allows me to live where I want to live, where I feel most mm. nourished and which is here with the forest and the mountain. So when was it that you got into the yoga, the meditation, the breath work? I'd always been really interested, but I felt very intimidated by it actually. So even at university, I can remember doing a few classes here and there. When I was doing lots of work in hospitals, I would sometimes see classes, but I'd always be super busy. So sometimes I'd book a class and then I'd cancel it or I wouldn't go because I was really not very good at prioritizing my own well-being at that point. Mm. And then when I had, took a shift out of that setting and then I did a research post, so I had a bit more of a kind of nine to five job for a period of time. I was able to then start doing some of these things. So I started to go to a class regularly And I think that was about 15 years ago that started for me. And it just, yeah, it's just started very gently, really. And for a long time, it was much more of a physical practice. So I would just go to classes or do videos at home. And then my meditation practice was part of my yoga. But my meditation then, I would say, probably over the last five years, has really developed into a tool which, for me now, is probably even more important than my movement practice. And did the breath work come around the same time as that or was that later? Yeah, I would say the breath work came at a similar time to the meditation in its depth. But interestingly, I'd been exposed to breath work during some of my work, actually. I was based in Leeds for a period of time and we were involved in this small study where we were looking at nurses' health in the hospital there. And as part of it, someone came in and they were teaching some mindfulness techniques and they taught a really simple breathwork technique, which is the square breath where you hold your breath and then breathe out and then hold again and breathe in. And I just adopted it without really thinking too much about it. And it was something that I'd often just go back to if I got really stressed, just think about this breath and just try it. So I was doing it without really linking it to breathwork. But I think over the probably over the last five years, that's become... I suppose I've learned more about it. I've learned more in terms when I did my yoga teacher training. I was very fortunate to be sharing that with teachers and being taught by really teachers who are very keen on parts of breathwork and incorporating that into yoga. So that that those aspects have really developed much more strongly for me in the last five years, I'd say. And you said that they developed more strongly for you in the last five years. Would you say more doctors have a greater awareness of the power or how beneficial breath work can be in the last few years as well yeah I think so and I think a lot of these holistic tools and approaches have probably become more I don't really like the word mainstream but I guess there's an element of there's more talk about it there's more conversations about it I think the power of some of the social media platforms helps YouTube is an amazing platform for all of these techniques really for trying different parts of it so I do think in general people are much more aware of these things Mm. and yes there is definitely a proportion of doctors who are now looking to bring in some of those holistic approaches particularly I think a lot of GPs who see patients coming back to them a lot of the time and realizing that there are aspects of maybe stress anxiety that are contributing to how a patient is feeling the the benefit of some of these techniques can be really fantastic for people because a lot of the time they're free and they have very few side effects and they can be things that people can learn for themselves and implement every day Mm. and so I think that increasingly there is a proportion of the sort of medical world that's starting to try and incorporate these things I know that there's a lot of talk particularly in the states as well but I think in the UK around the sort of healthy prescriptions prescribing Mm. some of these the lifestyle things it's a bit like the park runs I know Mm. that there's also that element of giving people opportunities to try out different approaches that they can use themselves I think that could be quite empowering for people Mm. 
So you talked about that when you first started discovering meditation and breathwork and so on. And was that because of a, a health issue that you went into that? Did you have some health issues yourself previously? No, not really. I think for meditation, I didn't really have any health issues, but I think I always felt quite angry, which is a strange thing to say. But I used to, yeah, I was a very calm person externally, but internally I always felt a little bit angry. And I angry start, with yourself or with the world? I think with the world, yeah, and sometimes with myself. And I think the meditation, I was starting to do my yoga teacher training and one of the yoga teachers that was training me was really heavily into meditation. And it was actually a form of meditation that I don't practice now, mm. but it started to show me the benefit of being still and just coming into that sort of state of observation and real kind of being mm. rather than doing. Mm. So that just suddenly opened something for me. And it was like someone had just pulled the curtains really to just give me this sense of space. Because I think I always used to run around a little bit hoping that someone would press a pause button for me on life and that I could catch up. <laughs> and then I discovered meditation. And for me, it just, it really gives me that sense of stillness and peace and grounding. And I just started to add it into my day. So very small amounts to begin with, are just five minutes a day. And then that's built up over time to now I practice about half an hour a day, sometimes more than once a day. But it is interesting you talk about health issues because last year I had a, quite a traumatic accident and I fractured both my wrists and one of my vertebrae in my spine. So it was really interesting for me to see immediately after I had done this accident, the first things that came into my mind were breathing and trying to get into that state of meditation to be able to come into and it was a state of acceptance really of what was going on but I also found it incredibly helpful for pain relief mm. and just in general for sort of overall healing and taking mm. that time to really get back to the level I wanted to be at so it's been interesting to see because I always had this sense that and I tell people this all the time that the more you practice these things the more they're there for you when you need them but I had going through something like that makes you really realize that that I think that is really true. For people maybe who aren't into meditation, you mentioned just now about getting more into the being rather than the doing. And some people might really not understand that. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So the way I see meditation is really taking that time to be still, that stillness. We're, our heads are always so full of thoughts and most of us live either in the past where we're rethinking things that have happened or we're starting to think about the future, making lists about what we must do in the, the afternoon or the day ahead. And I think what meditation allows us to do is to come back to that present moment, to be really in that present moment and to sit with whatever is going on. And that's what I feel that being is about, which isn't always comfortable. And I think that is something that sometimes people can find with meditation, that their thoughts may still come and go. But it's about being accepting of that state and allowing things to come up. And for me, that is the real beauty of it, because sometimes I meditate and it's I have millions of things that are coming in and I have to it's, sometimes it feels really hard. Other times it's really easy. But afterwards, there's always a sense of clarity and the benefit continues for the rest of the day, really. So I would recommend anyone who's interested to, to just try because there are so many different types of meditation that there is really something that I think that people can find that works for them. That might, that might look very different for different people. What tips would you give people who do want to start and they've struggled for whatever reason? So one of the things I find really helpful is to create a very small ritual uh, attached to it. So for me, that's just the same place that I go to and the same cushion that I sit on. It is no more complicated than that. But by doing that, I think it prepares you. So it prepares you to have your moment. 
And for people who have got busy households or families and they've got lots going on, I think finding that space where you know that you can be undisturbed can be so helpful. And the other thing I think is really important is not putting that huge expectation on yourself that you're going to do an hour every day. It's so easy to start like that, isn't it? With anything, with it, oh, I do an hour every day, it'd be brilliant. You just start with something that's really simple, mm. a minute. Just start mm. with a minute. And by doing that, see, start to see how it feels and start to see what you enjoy about it, what you don't. And then I think you can start to look at different types and add it in, but really start simply and just get that regularity of that habit coming into your day. And, and what about for yoga? What benefits? So maybe someone's listening who's dabbled or maybe never done yoga. What benefits could a regular yoga practice give them? So I, I think it, again, really goes to that state of meditation and breath because the practice of yoga and moving is really about connecting to the body and listening to your body, which is a thing I think a lot of us have lost that ability to do. Yes, it can be a very powerful practice. It can be great for getting stronger if, if that's something that somebody wants to do. It can be really good for flexibility as well. But Actually, what I see as the benefit of it is that time for yourself to connect to your body, to feel what your body is like. And by going through these postures and breathing at the same time, I think it can really help with underlying stress, underlying anxiety, and just give us that space again. So for me, it's when I roll that mat out, it's, this is me, this is where I am at this minute. And I try to you know, forget everything else that's going on and just be present with my mat and give myself that time to really tune in. And I think the more you practice it, the more you can really understand what you need. And then some days maybe you need to just lie down and do shavasana at the end of the practice where you're just lying flat on the floor and that can be really restorative for you. Other days, maybe you really need something that's energizing and that gives you a sense of you know activity and giving you more energy for the day ahead. So. I think, again, it's about exploring. And we are so fortunate that there's so many yoga teachers and there's so much out there to try. Mm. It's just really, I found it quite intimidating to begin with. I think people can feel like it's, what are these people doing? It's mm. just getting over that initial worry about that, I think. And I guess it's partly the media presenting these images of people sitting for meditation, sitting cross-legged and being perfectly still. And so that kind of increases people's stress oh I'm not doing it right or it's I, I can't yeah. do that yeah I used to think that about people meditating I did a small piece of work in Nepal once and it was amazing to watch the monks sitting for long periods of time and I think it stuck in my head so much that I just could I thought how on earth can I sit still for that long mm. there's an absolutely zero way I can do that because I was always someone who was busy. But actually, interestingly, once I started, it then became really attractive to me to understand what it was like to sit for much longer periods of time. And so I have done some silent retreats where you really do sit for the day. So you're sitting for an hour, two hours at a time meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's very interesting to see how your body responds to that experience. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been a very intrigue. It's also intriguing. I still like to try different approaches because... I think that's the, like we were saying before, it's the joy of life, really, to continue to see how you respond to things and learn from mm. trying out different approaches. In Especially in the last couple of years with the whole COVID thing, a lot of people are much more anxiety, more sh got more stress in their lives. Adding a daily yoga, meditation, breath work practice can only help surely with those and the stress and the anxiety and so on. Yeah, and I think it is, there's studies, so, you know, there's research studies to show that it really does make a difference. So it doesn't have to be a huge amount in your day. It could be 10, 15 minutes. Mm. But these practices, what well, I think what they all do is they give us that time for our nervous system to calm down, if you like. So if we think about what happens when we get overly stimulated, whether that's just scrolling on our phones or whether that's picking up calls all the time or being frantic at work or having demands for whatever you're being asked to do you're constantly in that sense of responding so your heart rate is always elevated your nervous system's kind of on edge you're like thinking what's next mm. and we've all been in that really across the time with the pandemic because mm. 
there was so much uncertainty that we were you worry about loved ones you worried about when you're going to see people you're worried about your own health so these practices which really calm down our nervous system are not just beneficial for the moment where we're doing them but they're also beneficial for the time when we're not doing them and I think that's the real positive for me with some of these practices because like I said they there are very few side effects of doing these practices yes obviously don't start doing a really active yoga class if you don't do a lot of physical activities try something that's very gentle to begin with Mm. but most people can probably find a yoga teacher and explain to them explain to the yoga teacher what you're looking for and make sure that what they're offering is the right thing for you And I think that's the beauty of things. Find a beginner's class, find something simple where other people are going to be learning alongside you. You've got some resources around that as well, haven't you? Yes, I've got a really nice little PDF, which has got six simple exercises that you can do in the morning. And it's really about energizing. It's all based on the spine. So it's like the six different movements of the spine. So it's just a really simple way to start getting connected to one part of your body Mm -hmm. without thinking, like you said, that you need to be able to do some dramatic poses to Mm -hmm. be able to do yoga. So yeah, I will definitely give you the link for that that you can share with your listeners. And going back to talking about working with clients and I I think you said you're mostly working online, but do you still work one-to-one with people as well? I sometimes do yoga one-to-one at the moment. I find that that's very different to what I'm doing online because that's within my community here. So yeah, we live in a community that is very rural and there's also a lot of exchange going on in the community rather than monetary value to things. So I do teach one-to-one with some people in our community, which just gives me that chance to continue helping people move in that environment, I think. As much as I love doing things online, it is different to be in person with people as well. It's fascinating when you just said about the kind of exchange. Are you talking about like in a kind of bartering system? Yeah. Yeah, we, it's, I would say it, it comes from a sense of taking away a, a value to something, but valuing everything, but not in a monetary sense. Right. So, For instance, our neighbours will bring us courgette plants to plant in the garden. We might share some of our produce with them. Our other neighbours would bring their goats down to eat some of the grass here. We might go and help someone for a day to chop some wood. It's part of the reason we moved here because it does really show you the benefits of what I suppose is that social capital. Mm. of that social interaction and that sense of community which I think is so important on your well-being and it's something I've always sought really in places I've lived and often (laughs) really struggled to find and it's interesting because we're in a very rural place here so some of our neighbours are half a kilometre up the road but Mm. yet I feel more a more sense of community here than I did maybe when I was living really close to people in a city or a town. And I think, yeah, we know that sense of community can be so important on your well-being and the things like loneliness and happiness levels and things. So it is really interesting here to see how that plays out in different ways. It sounds amazing. And did were you aware that was a situation before you moved there? Wow. Yeah, yeah, we were. So this area is very known for being it's very into sort of organic food organic ways of farming and so I suppose yeah over the last it's also about 15 years but we myself and my husband just became more and more interested in what we were eating and how that was linked to the environment and also we've become more and more aware of our our activities impact the environment so it was really important for us to try and find a community where other people were also aware of those things Mm. and also doing things that we feel are positive Mm. to try and create a better community a better a better planet if you like instead of living somewhere where that we felt very different and it was always harder to do those things that we wanted to do your work now are you more coaching or more still practicing as as a doctor where where is the balance now i would say the balance is about 50 50 so even my week probably looks like that i do about 50 percent of it with coaching clients and then 50 percent of it i will do on public health work 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes that changes in the seasons, if I get, depending on what's coming up. But it's a nice balance for me. I think mm. I was always, I've always been someone who likes quiet time and then likes interaction. So actually, I get the best of both worlds, really, having those two different aspects to my work. What do you get from doing a coaching? Why do you enjoy that? What aspect of it? I think some of that is that sort of one to one, which I guess is why I was really drawn to medicine. I really loved that interaction with a patient. Mm. So I suppose that part of it is that listening to someone and seeing someone and being able to help them to get through their challenges and see their way forward Mm -hmm. is very fulfilling, I think. And knowing that I can do that for my peers is, I just feel is, you know, I've got this experience that I've been through. So to be able to share it with them feels Mm. like a privilege, really. Mm. Because I do think in this world, there's very little that we invent, isn't there? Most of the time, it's just things that someone else has taught us that we're teaching. And I think that is part of, I suppose, our legacy in life, really, is that we keep teaching other people and sharing our experiences and Mm. doing what we can to support other people's lives as well. And when you are coaching, how easy or difficult is it to help people change behaviour? Yeah, I think it can be, it's really challenging. I think all of us know that behavior change can be challenging. I think it can be hard if also it comes along with beliefs that hold you back. And I find that with a lot of my clients is that because the biggest part that they want to change is often parts of their career to look at different jobs or to explore more holistic approaches maybe in the way that they're looking after their patients. It's very scary for them to step outside of what they perceive as stable what they perceive as normal and what they perceive as what they should be doing or looking at those expectations that they may be placing on themselves or they perceive other people placing on them so it's definitely can be a challenge but I think it's about working to try and uncover what those beliefs are and why they're there and to really also focus on where people want to get to because I think the more clarity you can have on your vision and what that feels like for you then you've got a real motivator to make a change and I think can be the bit that really helps people move from one place to another and then the other thing which I think is really key about all behavior change making those steps and actioning it but making it really small so we're not trying to jump ahead into big change without really just breaking it down into much smaller chunks to be able to feel positive about what we're doing Mm. and i and i also think like increasing the positivity rather than focusing on the negativity i think that's something we often do with habits this it's very easy to think i don't want to do this and i I wish i didn't do this so i'm going to try not to do that it's all very negative. Whereas if we can spin it to a positive of, I'd like to bring more joy into my life. I'd like to be more present for my family and my children. I want to nourish myself more. There's a real positivity there. And I think that can really help bringing those positive things into your life. Usually by doing that, the negative things will step away. Mm. When you've been working with people, whether it be in a coaching capacity or as a doctor, and people find out more about your, what sounds like an amazing location and the neighbours and everything. It, I wonder, has anyone actually been tempted to move there because it sounds so good? I suppose the way we're living here is, uh, for some people, feels very different and interesting. So I think we get lots of people wanted to come for retreats or holidays to dip right. into it, which is wonderful because we also really believe that it's important that we share what we're trying to do we don't have all the answers by any means we're just Mm. trying to try different approaches whether that's energy use or water or food or whatever it is here no one's moved yet but who knows we'll see (laughs) see with our summer visitors we've got friends coming in their camper vans from the uk who knows they might not go back i remember i lived in quite a few countries and one of the places i lived in indonesia and there were so many people who came out there just to visit friends and just never went back. There were so many people. (laughs) Come with their one backpack and stay for years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Changing the subject, is there a, a book that's moved you for any reason that you can think of? Yeah, so this book, which is called Will Your Way Back, is written by a guy called James Osborne. And I read this last year when I was recovering from my accident. And he tells his own story of a very freak accident, which is for most accidents are. They're things that just happen to us. But it's very much about his recovery from a spinal injury. And he was a very physical person. He was very into sports. So it's his recovery. And I think what's inspiring to me and the reason that it moved me is I think it shows the sort of tenacity and the determination of him. And at the same time, there were so many moments in his recovery where things changed and he had to adapt and he had to find that sort of sense of inner resilience to keep moving forward Mm. but at the same time accept also what was difficult and challenging Mm. and I think that's got a lot of lessons that it was really helpful for me to read in my own recovery but I think it can be really inspiring for people when they're going through any challenges it doesn't have to be a physical challenge necessarily but I think some of those lessons can be really helpful to, Mm. to give people the motivation to keep going. So if people want to find out more about you or maybe work with you, where where would they go to? So my brand is called Resilience Yoga. My website is www.resilienceyoga.fr because I'm Mm. in France. And I'm also on Facebook. So I'm Rachel Beanland on Facebook. So if people want to contact me, they can contact me through my website and it's easy to send me a a little message there or they can DM me on Facebook and I'd be happy to chat with anyone who wants to find out more. We'll include the resources you mentioned before about the meditation and stuff. They'll be in, in the show notes so if anyone's looking for that, along obviously with a transcript and everything. So just before we finish, is there a quotation that you particularly like? Yeah, so the quotation I'm going to share with you is a quotation from Andrew Zolli. So Andrew Zolli is really, I don't know whether people will know him, but he does a lot of sustainability and global impact initiatives. So his quote is, sustainability aims to put the world back into balance and resilience looks for ways to manage an imbalanced world. So the reason that I'm sharing that with you is that for me, resilience, and obviously I've called my brand Resilience Yoga, Mm. but resilience is really, I think, something that we should all be looking at in terms of the future of what the planet looks like and how we as individuals and communities can be more resilient to the things that come our way, whether those are the things in our personal life or the things in the world around us. But for me, that quote really brings home that sense of trying to find that balance again. And did you come across that quote before you named your company or or was it afterwards? afterwards but yeah my husband actually shared the quote with me so yeah it was after I'd already named the company so it just really yeah I suppose it what it does is it pulls together all the different aspects of my life really in how we're living what my work focuses on so it's yeah it's a nice it's a nice quote I like to share yeah it is a nice quote Rachel thank you thank you very much for your time and best of luck for the future thank you thank you so much for inviting me it's been so nice to chat to you thank you Next week, Mark Young, episode 74, who joined the Zona Health team in 2016 with the purpose of making Zona Plus a household name. So we're going to find out what is Zona Plus and who are Zona Health? What is it they do? They do a lot of things that help people. They've got passion for education. They improve people's health. And education is the real key to how they help improve people's health. So that's next week, episode 74 with Mark Young. Thanks for tuning into the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. You can also sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast.